We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I really do appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It is that time once again where we look to the stars and the man behind all of our UFO news for the unbiased UFO report is Mr. John Hudson, who always has a beautiful black Stetson on when he gives his report. John, thank you so much for kicking off the week once again. Happy to be here. Thank you much for having me. We we are glad that you are here as well. Now, let's kick it off right off the bat here because Ross Coltart, I actually had a phone conversation with him for about 40 minutes yesterday. And we were just talking about some UFOs. Great guy. Wants to bring some serious, serious investigative journalism into this case. And and he said to me yesterday, he goes, Dave, people need to realize that I know that I'm the flavor of the day right now, but I'm not a ufologist. I am somebody uh, that is an investigative journalist taking this subject very, very seriously. You got some news on Ross. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it just it, it illustrates what he said. He's going to keep on punching. He's going to keep on crawling because as long as there's a story to follow, he's going to keep digging into it because it's he's not a believer. He he's he's a journalist, you know. Yeah. So basically, um, so I don't know how many of you are are aware of the the, the Westfall UFO incident. It, it was a, a an incident in Australia um, where you know there, there was a, a significant sighting uh, during the day and for the sake of, of, of you know the, the timeline in the show I, I can't go into much detail about it but uh, Ross started investigating it as part of his book and he initially didn't think much of it because um, even though it's a very well um, documented um, ex- uh, event from a um, uh, you know people who were interviewed from the uh, government side it's it's not a documented event at all. And and so he went in there very skeptical until he met this science teacher that was willing to to come out and, and actually, you know, go public with his name that um, basically had someone knock on his door. Uh, one guy in a military uniform, another guy in a suit and basically tell him you're going to stop talking about this and you're going to keep your mouth shut or we're going to spread rumors that you're a drunk and that you have all sorts of, of mental challenges and we will make sure that you lose your teaching job and you never work again. And like, I, I don't even care. Like, I don't care if they were UFO. They could have been a black program. You don't do that to your own citizens, right? Like what drives someone to do that to your citizens? So that really got Ross's interest going. And through a, a contact that he actually already had for other reasons, um, he found out that there was a, a gentleman whose father had written a report on this event and it actually submitted the report on this event so this gave ross the clue that there is possibly a document in existence and he happened to find a lawyer that's willing to work pro bono and wants to essentially take this on for him and so the lawyers put together a a small team of people and um they will essentially be going at the uh australian government uh from a from a legal point of view and will essentially be you know um i don't know what the proper term is in their framework but in ours it would be essentially suing for the release of this document and um you know i he, his confidence level is kind of you know here or there because they don't have all the same quite of guarantees to information that we do in the United States, but um, he's, um, he's very excited. And I'm just excited to see that Ross is uh, uh, assembling a, a, a dedicated team to attack something in particular and that he's, he's continuing to step up his game and who knows, this might turn into something really interesting. I hope it does because I think he's starting to realize that there's a lot of dark secrets in this story And the more he investigates in my private conversation with him, and I know he's been meeting with Bryce Zabel, another person who I've talked to recently, 
you know, I know that they are very compelled to bring out the true story of what is truly happening with the UFO story right now. And we need proper journalism in this story. The mainstream media has not done a sufficient job in asking those tough questions, in my opinion. And I'm saying that as a former media member, I am saying that I think that they have, for the majority of them, fallen along with the narrative that has been provided and handed to them by the United States government. That includes across the border here in Canada. And, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things, uh, John, and I'll just let you know and our listeners know that I was talking to our station manager at Saga 960, Jody Panu, uh, earlier today via email, and they are hoping to get candidates meetings because now in Canada, we are going to be heading to a federal election in September. And with that federal election, I have challenged the radio show hosts there that if any of the potential party leaders come on the station or anybody running for candidacy in that area, we are going to pose the UFO question to them. And we're going to see what the Canadian response is. Because I can tell you right now, if they were to get Prime Minister Trudeau on the air, I know he met and has been read in. I know that for a fact, 100%. I have no paperwork trail, but the people whom I have talked to have confirmed that he has been read in and that a meeting took place between him and Canada's ambassador in 2019 after the ambassador, a guy named David McNaughton, McNaughton, pardon me, was read in uh, by Lou Elizondo's successor on this subject. So... We're going to try and be at the forefront there at Saga 960 when this story comes out. That's All right. huge. And, and, I, and I have to say with Trudeau, I don't want to get into your politics, but he's a technical guy. He can explain technical issues very well. So it would be super interesting to hear him talk on the subject. Well, he can't explain too much well. <laughs> with, you have to eliminate the 46 ums and ahs in a 10-word sentence. All right, moving on here. Let's go to Grant Cameron because him and Nikki or Nicole Sackage, Nikki Sackage, whatever you want to call her, they did a great rundown mm. of this uh, report that you first reported on here last week that Tom DeLong and Jim Semivan did, talking uh, their first real public statements since the two of the Stars Academy had literally half their power team fold when Luis Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and Steve Justice left back in December of 2020. Yep, and, and to a degree, Hal Putoff as well. I mean, Hal Putoff is still uh, on the board, but he he doesn't have his his internal director role um, anymore. And so, and you know, that was a week later, and kind of you know didn't get noticed by many people. But I mean, this was you know this was a, a big a big change in things. Yeah. So this is you know I'll be honest with people. Um, you know, th- this is a this is a, uh, a, a a report by by Grant that is for those of you that like to get into the weeds. But if you like to get into the weeds, I could not recommend this more. It's a, it's a it's a good listen. And what he does is that he does a he goes through, primarily relying on the documents that he uh, acquired through the, the WikiLeaks um, stuff, and uh, and basically goes through the emails, goes through a lot of the the news items and so forth, and and stitches together a nice timeline of sorts. Uh, for like when, what happened and where, which happened. And it actually kind of, uh, you know, in an interesting way, kind of um, uh, it's very compatible with uh, some of what Ross does in, in his book as well. So if any of you are reading that, you'll, you'll find some, some synergies there, but it, it's, um, it's a very, very interesting. It was a very, very interesting thing to listen to. I, I you know, I didn't, for example, realize that um, the, it kind of brings to light some of the challenges that Tom had of people, you know, telling him one thing to his face and then saying other things in meetings and really frustrating him. And so it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a very, very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting topic. And if you enjoy that stuff, I I highly recommend Grant's, uh, Grant's presentation. I don't think Tom DeLong is a bad guy in this. I think he was the wrong guy. And I think he was the perfect patsy for a great story. Uh, A famous musician with millions of followers on social media 
talking UFOs. It, it was a perfect storm. I think he got played. And I think that he, he was not the first one to do to not the first one to be played either. No, and and I still stand behind a lot of the words that I that I said about him when we had our marathon show last week, okay, where we went forever and ever and ever. People could check that out on YouTube. And but I can tell you, I, I really do believe that Tom was played. I don't believe for a second that the story about how he was the brilliant mastermind of putting that team together sounds way too simplistic. All right. They may have given him the names and the emails to contact, but I don't believe that for a second. And we'll see where it goes. Let's move on here. Next topic. I, this is one that I'm getting very, very interested in because John Greenwald from the blackvault.com has a, a little bit of breaking news here that NASA is actually going to be debriefed on UFOs. You yes. know, I mean, yes, they're going to hear from the UAPTF, but come on, NASA, are well, we really supposed to believe that you know nothing about UFOs? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? Uh, they they know about them from their point of view, right? And their point of view is very specific, right? I actually got into a debate with someone on Twitter about this today about about you know how much um, even or even observation even near Earth NASA actually does. Uh, you know they're very focused on on external planets. And um, now the International Space Station obviously has a hell of a view for things. Um, and so, you know, they're aware. But what I really think, because you, you got to remember that this this kind of connects with a story I did a couple weeks ago where, you know, we, we talked about the fact that NASA got briefed uh, last year. So this is NASA's second briefing. I mean, as far as we know. And uh, and John did get it confirmed that the meeting is happening tomorrow, although he he was not able to get it confirmed that um, that Bill Nelson will be showing up personally. But I, they wouldn't tell him anyway for security reasons. So my guess is that he'll, he'll probably be there. But this is their second briefing. And so what that means is one is there there's there's follow up from the previous meeting. So there, there, was, there was things asked for at the previous meeting that will then be brought to this meeting. Okay, that's, that's one thing. And the second thing is, is that the UAPTF has now become a, an exchange point for all these different offices. Now, if NASA wants to find out what the DOE knows, they can find it out through a briefing with the UAPTF. If, if the Air Force wants to find out, you know, uh, what the Navy is doing, not from the Navy, but from a from a, a more uh, you know um, unbiased third party, they can hear what they're doing through. The, so the UAPTF has now become this this central hub where everyone can exchange information without actually having to connect and brief each other in in a, in a more you know uh, precarious situation. And so it's very possible that everything that that they're told at this meeting will actually be new to them. Because it will be stuff that was was gained from the perspective of the Navy, perspective of the Air Force, perspective of the Army, perspective of, of who else. It, it, they're not going to be hearing NASA's perspective. And so, you know, I think there is a lot they can glean from it. But but I certainly understand your your emotional reaction to it. I think a lot of people have the same reaction where they're like, you know, come on, is this just theater? And I, I really don't think it is. I, and, and also, I don't think it's unidirectional. I, I, I think it's I think it's a, a bi-directional communication. I think this is also an opportunity for Bill Nelson to share with the UAPTF what he's gleaned in the last couple of weeks now that he's actually greenlighted some of his top people to look into the problem. So I, I'm, I'm hoping it's a fruitful meeting, but it is classified. And so don't expect to hear anything out of it. Well, I mean, I don't expect to hear anything out of anything. I mean, NASA has their own secrets. I mean, we've heard everything from from astronauts saying that they've seen things in the in the sky while up in space. We've seen uh, people come out publicly saying that they've seen and witnessed uh, NASA scrub photographs of UFOs. Yep. We've seen yep. feeds cut to the International Space Station. Yep. I mean, yep. they're just as dirty as anything on this subject. No, it, it's people don't people people forget. I mean, NASA NASA uh, NASA Ames, which is right near me, they've only been open to the public once in twenty five years. 
and it was for one morning <laughs> that like otherwise you cannot go on to that you cannot get onto that campus like that that is not a um that is not a a, a, a huggy feely you know uh rainbows and ponies organization and um yeah no it's it's uh, it's an interesting problem and actually one new point that comes out in ross's book is that um uh, edgar mitchell's uh best friend um is saying that um that uh edgar mitchell confided in him uh just a few days before his death that um that he did see something um when uh went on the moon and that he was basically told that it would be treason if he ever told anyone about it so for them to be if that's true if that's true and if if an astronaut was was told it will be treason if you if you talk about this one that shows how seriously they take it to make that sort of, for that sort of a threat to essentially a hero and two it might explain the very glum look on the gentlemen's faces when they did that um, uh, press conference uh, the few days after they got back from that walk on the moon because they all left very happy go lucky and they all came back looking very solemn and sad very true john we'll talk to you with the next unbiased ufo report in just a couple nights time thank you so much we always appreciate you coming on to spaced out radio here we go with the news